Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to crisis, business continuity, resilience, well-being, COVID, emergency management, anything that helps you, your organization, or your community prepare for, respond to, and overcome adverse situations. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Alex Fullick there. I'm really easy to find, and I do respond to everything I get. Today is going to be a little bit different. Um, we've talked about some terrorism on uh, the show before in previous episodes. Um, we're going to change that up a little bit today. We're going to look at, uh, the topic is living with the impacts of terrorism. And I'm really uh, honored to have with me today, Anne Travers. Anne, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you for having me on. And now today's going to be a very personal show. And um, part of me is very nervous <laughs> you know, to talk about this because I know you are going to share a very personal story and, and incidents. Um, and another part of me is very excited because it is something new that I haven't addressed before. So uh, I'm really looking forward to, to this uh, chat. But before we get into all of that, could you take a moment to uh, introduce yourself, what you do, and how you got into what you do, without trying to give some of the topic away today? Okay. Well, as you've already said, my name's Anne Travers. Um, I was born in Belfast on, in 1969 and grew up during the Troubles. And my family were impacted by the Troubles. Um, terrorism came to our door. And a number of years ago, about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, it raised its head again for me that from what happened came, came, back, into, came back into my life unexpectedly, which um, brought me back down into a place where I thought I'd never have to go to again. It was very traumatic. And it built up within me a bit of... Um, I felt that I had to speak up on behalf of um, victims of terrorism, but more especially of my own family and my own sister, who I'll talk about later on. And from that, then I ended up, um, now I, 11 years on, I, I started work with a victim's charity in Northern Ireland. I live in the Republic of Ireland and I'm an advocate for victims and survivors of terrorism um, here in the Republic of Ireland. And I speak out on many issues concerning um, victims and survivors today. Um, <clears throat> now, I, I recall from the uh, information you provided me that you also, uh, or your your organization at least, also deals with victims in other parts of the globe, not just North yes. of, Northern Ireland. But that's Northern indeed. Ireland is going to be your Yeah, story. indeed we do. We, we do with, we support victims in Great Britain and also over in Europe who um, were impacted. And we also then have um, people that we support who live in Australia now, um, where they were maybe in Europe when something happened to them or they've, or they've, um, they've emigrated. So yeah, we support all over really. Whoever needs our support or whoever needs that ear or the advocacy or, or you know, we, we will support. Now you mentioned the troubles uh, and you've mentioned terrorism first can we talk about terrorism what is terrorism and what isn't it well for me um terrorism is not being able to go out to your job or or take part in daily life without that fear that something is going to happen unexpectedly. So whether it's the bomb in the shopping centres or whether it's um, a bomb under your car, you start up your car to go to work in the morning um, or being being shot as you go about your business, you know, whether it's coming out from, from mass, whether it's dropping your kids off to school, answering your front door. For me, that is terrorism. Um, People often use, there's a quote they'll always use, you know, one, one person's ter terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. And I would say 
a murder is still always a murder, mm -hmm. you know, regardless. And um, I don't feel that, you know, people again often describe what happened in Northern Ireland to say it was a war. What happened in Northern Ireland was not a war. It doesn't actually even fit into the international definition of a war. It's nothing like what's going on in Ukraine or what we have seen in Syria um, in, in recent years. It was people who put on masks, who wore wigs, who disguised themselves or went under, in the middle of the night under the earth's darkness to fight to murder. And um, they weren't defending anything. On their, I suppose in their minds, they were, you know, for Republicans, they were felt that they were fighting the British to have the British leave um, Northern Ireland. And for loyalists, they felt that they were fighting Republicans so they could remain part of um, Great Britain or the United Kingdom. But for the rest of us, the people in between, the absolute in the innocents, the people who didn't choose to lift up a gun, who um, tried to go about our own business, it was absolute terrorism. And ironically, I left Northern Ireland um, for about five years. I left Ireland and I went to live in England. And before I left, um, I was having terrible nightmares about loyalist gunmen breaking into my home and shooting me in my bed at night because I'm a Catholic, even though it was Republican terrorists who actually came to our door. So that, for me, with terrorists, it's, it is that fear. It's still like, you know, you get on a flight I still think about 9-11, even if I got onto a plane, you know, is this is mm -hmm. I no longer take for granted that my my flight is going to land safely at my destination. And I think with terrorists, they put that fear into you to try to stop you from living your life um, as you should be allowed to do. So that for me, that's what that's what terrorism is. Uh, living in fear 24-7. 24-7. And even now, I would say that um, I would still be impacted by that and still worry because of what I do that something might happen to me or they might try to do something, whether it's not necessarily a threat to my life, but whether it's a threat to my livelihood or, um, or something else, you know, whether it's to blacken my name or whatever. I still have that fear. And I will never say... Or very, very rarely let people know where I'm going until I actually have been there and left. So, you know, mm -hmm. people are saying, are you, because I live um, just outside of Dublin, they say, are you going up to Northern Ireland? Are you going up to Belfast? And I say, yes, I am. But I won't say when or where or what I'm doing because I still have that, I still have that fear. And that might be completely irrational, but it's a fear that I live with. So... Would I be correct in saying that terrorism activities could be over, but the impacts linger for years? Oh, absolutely. In fact, does. And unfortunately here in Ireland, um, where we are not having the bombings and the, and the, and the daily murders, we are having, um, there's another type of what I call cyber terrorism. So if you go online or if you speak out publicly, um, where and if your voice is authentic and articulate, where they will try to close that voice down. And that has happened on many occasions, not just to me, but to journalists, to other victims and survivors. There's very few victims and survivors of the troubles who actually, from Republican terrorism, I'm not talking about um, the, those that were killed by the state, um, because they, they, they are, seem to be in bigger groups and they seem to have, the, they have support from Republicans. They seem to be able to speak out more. But there's very few re victims of Republican terrorism who actually speak out because when you do, there is um, sheer just abuse and, bully and fear. You know, I, I understand why people don't do it. I really do. Hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, you've mentioned uh, the Troubles. What exactly is the Troubles? Because I don't think a lot of people really understand what that is. Okay. So it was a time of um, conflict, I suppose, in Northern Ireland. And we always knew it was growing up as being the Troubles, which some people say, just using the word the Troubles, diminishes um, what actually happened. 
but it's a it's a difficult one to explain. Um, there was um, gerrymandering. There were um, rights for uh, Catholics were were low, um, but and there were political parties who were trying to get equal rights for um, Catholics with voting and that and it just they were trying to do it peacefully and then we have people who felt that on both sides both within loyalist which is extreme um, I don't want to say extreme unionism but you know that streams of like between Protestants and Catholics, you know, so mm-hmm. typically you're thinking nationalist Republicans are Catholics, lo- unionist loyalists are Protestants. That would be a typical thing, although there are quite a number of Catholics who'd also be unionist, and and there may be some Protestants who are also nationalists who 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 would want to have a united Ireland who don't want to have we don't want to be part of um the UK. So it started out with um killings. Actually it was a police man, I think, that was killed by um loyalists. I think it was the first killing and then it um went on from there we you know what people know about bloody sunday perhaps where um the there was a peace um uh march going on and the soldiers shot at and there were people killed at that and um that then but in 1972 whenever that happened there were so many many murders from both sides of the community. And I think it was probably one of our worst years, really. Um, and yeah, and the troubles, I suppose, it just went on like that. I, I said I was a child at that time. I was born in 1969. And um, all I ever remember were, when we actually, I think my very first word was bomb. Um, it wasn't mummy or daddy, it was bomb. And all I remember ever were bombs going off, gunfire going off. So uh, there was security going into town. I was used to being searched. You know, I remember actually my parents brings, we went down to Dublin for a day trip. I think my mum wanted to go to a shop called Switzer's. There was a sale or something on. And I stopped at the mum and dad and my brothers and sister all went on in front of me. And dad came back to get me. And uh, I had my arms stretched out. And he said, what are you doing, Anne? And I said, I'm waiting to be searched, daddy. And he said, oh, they don't do that um, here. And we were able to go in. But, you know, that was just my automatic reaction was, mm-hmm. um, you know, just of being searched. So I suppose it was a time of violence, of deep civil disturbance within um, Northern Ireland and Ireland, and where you had the provisional IRA, other Republican factions, and um, the the UVF, which stands for the Ulster Volunteer Force, and UDA, and... Um, all combining to shoot civilians and those who served in security forces. And then you had people, some people from the security forces who also acted criminally and um, also were involved in murders. Um, the vast majority from the security forces were not involved in murders, but there were those that did. And, you know, we can't ignore that and we have to acknowledge it. Um, it's, it's very difficult for somebody like me who's always been very law-abiding and he's always, you know, Follow the law to think that some of the people who we trusted broke the law at times, but um, yeah, but these were people who acted criminally and they let down their own uniform and their own colleagues, um, of whom the majority of I mean, there are over 100,000 RUC officers, which would be Royal Ulster Constabulary police officers at that time, um, and you're talking about a very tiny percentage of that hundred thousand who acted criminally, and yet they've all got they've all been painted with the same um brush, you know. Yeah. And it's wrong, really wrong, because those families lost their husbands and wives and daughters, and um, while going about their duty just for doing their job. On that note, we've come to the end of our first segment. We are talking with Anne Travers today on the topic of living with the impacts of terrorism. You're not going to want to miss our second segment. We'll be right back. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, stay prepared, everybody. <laughs> 